principle is that order in the environment will lead to order in the child's mind. Some of the research on this concerns the physical arrangement of children's classrooms. Researchers will go into children's home with an instrument called the home inventory in which they rate many different aspects of a child's home, some of which have to do with how orderly the environment is, like there are set places for the children's toys, for example. What they find is that children whose homes are more orderly fare better on all kinds of cognitive tests from the infant daily all the way up. And this is even when you control for the parent's level of education, the parent's level of income, and other things that you would expect might be associated with orderly homes. We also know that children who are raised in less noisy environments, so I think of this as auditorily more orderly environments, also do better than children who are in auditorily less organized or noisy environments. So children who are raised in the flight paths of major airports have language difficulties that are not seen in children who, are, are seen much less frequently in children who are not raised in such noisy environments. And when sound attenuating materials are installed in school classrooms in the flight paths of major airports, children's language performance in those classrooms improves the following year. We also know that children who are raised in families that engage in more routines and rituals fare better in many ways than children who are raised in less ordered families. So, and, and we've seen this in many different samples, rural and urban children, single, married, and so on, and we've seen it in many different kinds of outcomes. The daily standardized achievement measures, physical health, happiness, school, number of friends, and so on. So children who are raised in families where there's a set way that you have dinner each night, a set set of routines that you go through with setting the table and clearing the table and so on, a set way that bedtime has gone about, a set way that uh, different annual celebrations are carried out, these children do much better than children who are raised in families where everything is done differently all the time. Now you may be thinking to yourself, gee, you know, this is a place where traditional education might really have gone up on Montessori education because traditional education is very ordered, right? You know, you arrive in the morning, now you're going to do your English, now you're going to do your math, now you're going to have your recess and so on. It's very tightly ordered. Well, you have to balance out order with choice and control. And Montessori balances this out in a very interesting way. You've got a lot of order at the micro level. So there is a set way to use a material. There's a set set of steps that a child needs to go through. And yet, in a macro level, there's a good deal of freedom and choice. So that's how Montessori balances this out. In traditional education, this isn't so well balanced. It's order all the way through, so it's constricting the, the choice and the control. Montessori said, pedagogically, the work of the school is to organize the work of the child. The organizing of the child's work and offering this work to the child is a very exact work. The organization of the work leads to the establishment of mental order. So many of the materials even are about putting things back in order, developing order for the child. In sum, psychology research would suggest that evidence-based education, if we had it, would involve movement, would be based on interest and on choice, would avoid extrinsic rewards and evaluation, would involve peer interaction, would be situated in meaningful contexts, would involve warm, loving adults who structure the child's experience, and would occur in an organized curriculum and environment, all insights that Montessori had early and incorporated in her system of education. But I'd like to end with thinking about Montessori in terms of how she began to see this later in her life. Because as she went through her life and saw the world ravaged by two world wars, people treating each other terribly, as, as the Nazis in Germany treated others, she began to see the system more and more about what it, as being what it could do for human development. So she saw the peace that children have in the classroom, the empathy that you see in well-functioning Montessori classrooms, the way children reach out to each other, and the way that they think responsibly about the world and about helping others. And she started to have a grander vision for what these schools could do. She said, our principal concern must be to educate humanity the human beings of all nations, in order to guide it towards seeking common goals. We must turn back and make the child our principal concern. 
The efforts of science must be concentrated on the child because the child is the source of and the key to the riddles of humanity. The child is richly endowed with powers, sensitivities, and constructive instincts that as yet have neither been recognized nor put to use. In order to develop, the child needs much broader opportunities than have been offered thus far. Might not this goal be reached by changing the entire structure of education? Thank you all uh, very much. I want to briefly put acknowledgments of Anvu's uh, wonderful photographs, and there's also photos by uh, Karen Compia and Ami USA and Ami. Thank you.